Welcome back everybody to our class introduction to quantum optics. In this lecture, we want to discuss the so-called Ramsey interferometer. And as you'll see, that's just a Marcinder interferometer in the internal state space of the atom. So having discussed the Marcinder interferometer for optics, I'm sure you'll do well in understanding how this Marcinder interferometer, named after Nobel Prize winner Norman Ramsey, functions in the atoms in our two-level atom. So let's get started. So one of the motivations of Norman Ramsey and his colleagues at the time was to do the highest possible precision spectroscopy of transitions in an atom. So they wanted to determine the transition frequency omega 2 1 of let's say two energy levels to the highest possible accuracy. Now we know by time energy uncertainty in order to do that with high precision we have to have a long interaction time of the light field with the atoms. That ultimately determines the line width to which we can determine the transition frequency. Now this is a typical setup that we might consider. You have an oven that spits out particles in the ground state. They fly out with different uh, directions. You only select the ones that propagate in the forward direction. Now you have kind of inter interaction zone where your light field or your electromagnetic field in general interacts with the atom. It, it drives some transition from one state, state one, to an excited state, state two, and then you have a state-dependent state detector which can measure this excited state population, for example, and that's plotted here. This is what it was typically, would typically look like. The population in the excited state would be given by the sink function for rectangular pulses. And the width of the sink function, remember, was just given by the time of flight time or the interaction time of our oscillatory field with the atom. Now, in order to make that more precise, of course, what you would have to do is make this interaction zone just longer. Okay, so you just have to make that longer and longer and longer to get longer interaction times. You could also slow your atoms down, but that was way before their time. So you could actually use laser cooling to make the atoms very slow, interact very long with your kind of interaction zone. But that was not available to Norman Ramsey at his time. So you had to think of another method how to do that. So uh, another way how to do that will actually encounter that goes is a little bit better than just making the interaction zone longer. Just making the interaction zone longer, as you might imagine, can introduce a lot of technical problems uh, alone, not to be said by stray fields that you encounter other kind of artifacts. So really, he thought of a much more clever way how to do this. What he actually thought of was to uh, realize a so-called separatory oscillatory field method. Actually, that's what he called the Ramsey interferometer, but I guess you would agree Ramsey interferometer is much shorter and better in kind of using that for this method. So uh, here's what the situation looks like. We have again the oven that kind of emits the particles in the ground state. We have a first interaction zone, interaction zone one, where we apply a resonant pi over two pulse to the atoms. So now the atom was in the ground state, it's now in a coherent superposition of state one and two and starts has an oscillating dipole, so it oscillates. Now, after passing this interaction zone two, it's in free flight. So there's nothing, atom is just now in the superposition state. It's oscillating at its natural resonance frequency, omega two one, it's dipole. It's oscillating electron clouds that you've seen are just oscillating back and forth. Now comes interaction zone two. Interaction zone two, we again apply a pi over two pulse to the system. And now depending on the phase of the oscillating dipole relative to the phase of the field, as we'll see, we can either have the atoms more in the excited state or in the ground state. And we can able, we're able to measure that in the state dependent detector, which measures the atoms in state one or state two. So let's break this down again. We have these three things that are happening here really. So the first thing that's happening in uh, zone one is the pi over two pulse, which brings us into a coherent superposition state of state one and two. So this is now one plus I two. We had this rotation by 90 degrees around the U axis, which brings us into this coherent superposition state of one and two. And thereby we've excited an oscillating dipole in our electron cloud, in our, of our electrons in the atom. Now in this free time of flight period, zone two, if the light field is resonant, if omega is resonant with the atomic transition frequency omega two one, 
then the atom atomic dipole is going to oscillate in phase with the light field and we're not going to acquire any phase angle in the equatorial plane of our blosphere. Remember, if we have, were detuned, we're going to rotate around the W axis at an angular frequency given by the tuning, uh, giving us a phase angle that's determined by the detuning and the time of flight, this free time of flight where the light field is off. And then we apply another pi over 2 pulse. So this in the second zone, we might acquire a phase shift between the atom and the light field that's given by the detuning and the free time of flight time. And in zone three, we apply another pi over two pulse, which again takes the amplitude in state one and brings it into a coherent superposition of one and two, and the amplitude of state two into a coherent superposition of one and two. And thereby, if we look at the total amplitude in state one, that's going to be a superposition of uh, the original amplitude plus this phase shifted amplitude, okay, where we can acquire, measure this phase acquired during this free time of flight time. So we can actually think of this in terms of a Marcinda interferometer, where this pi over 2 pulse is our 50 50 beam splitter. Then we have something that introduces a phase shift between the two states 1 and 2 like the thin plate of glass we introduced in our Marcinda interferometer that introduced a phase shift between arms one and two. So this is the phase shifter. And we could have other ways of introducing this phase shift, simply going to happen if we have detuned light compared to our atomic transition frequency. And what this action of this uh, third uh, part of the Marcinda interferometer, of the Ramsey interferometer is another pi over two pulse, which again acts like a 50-50 beam splitter. And like that, you see, those were exactly the elements we had for a Marcinda interferometer. The beam splitter, the phase shifter, and another beam splitter that combines the two beams and allows us to measure the relative phase of the uh, two arms of the interferometer as different populations in the output of the interferometer. So you might remember in the Marcinda interferometer, we had two output arms, right? Where are these two output ports uh, here in the case of the internal state uh, of our atom? Well, they're just the population in the excited state and the population in the ground state. Those are the two complementary output ports of our interferometer. They're complementary because we know that row 2, 2 plus row 1, 1 equals 1. And that was like the same thing that we had like energy conservation for the light field. The sum of the light field intensities had to give the total input light intensity of our electromagnetic field interferometer. The two intensities at the output had to sum up to the total intensity we put in at the input. And uh, here the same thing shows up as the probability conservation of row 2, 2 and row 1, 1 being 1. So whenever row 2, 2 is high, row 1, 1 is low and vice versa. So we have the two complementary output ports of our interferometer. And the input ports are of course also just the states 1 and 2 that we have. So you see this internal space state analysis is exactly the same like what we had in the Marcinda interferometer case for optics. Now let's go through the different steps one by one and see what can happen in such an interferometer. Okay, so let's do this one by one. Let's start with the atom in the ground state coming out of our oven. We're in this minus one W axis situation where we're pointing to the south pole. The first pi over two pulse, the beam splitter, brings us into the equatorial plane of the Bloch sphere, right? It, it creates a coherent superposition state between states one and two and we are now pointing here in this minus v direction. And uh, now we are going to apply the next pi over 2 pulse. And the action of the next pi over 2 pulse is going to depend sensitively on the phase that we acquire during this free time of flight time. So let's say we were resonant. So we had a situation where we had resonant light pulses. So the axis around which you rotate the block vector, remember that was just minus omega 0, 0 delta. Uh, in the free flight time, omega zero vanishes, that's just zero. And if you have the tuning also vanishing, that's zero. So there's no rotation uh, of the Bloch vector during such a free time of flight period uh, between the two interaction zones when you're resonant. 
uh, meaning that the oscillating dipole oscillates exactly in phase with the oscillating light field. So both are locked to each other. Okay. So now when we apply the final pi over 2 pulse, it's just like having two pi over 2 pulses in sequence. Two pi over 2 pulses make a pi pulse, so you come out in the excited state of the atom in the state 0, 0, 1. Now let's imagine a situation with the tuning. Okay, so let's look at a situation where we have a detuning in the, uh, in the time of flight period. So again, we create a first coherent superposition state in the first kind of beam splitter zone, pi over 2 interaction zone. Then we have a free time of flight. And let's imagine that this detuning is set such that delta times t, the angle that we pick up in the equatorial plane when we rotate around the w axis, is just pi. Okay, let's just consider that situation for a second. So we have a detuning which multiplied by the time of flight time gives us a rotation angle of pi. So now we're rotating around the w axis with an angle of pi. So you see this block vector is going to rotate in this free time of flight time from here to here to its new position pointing now in the plus v direction. Now comes the final pi over 2 pulse, another pi over 2 pulse. But this pi over 2 pulse does not excite the atom anymore. It rotates the block vector by another 90 degrees. But since the block vector is pointing in the plus v direction, now the block vector is going to go into the ground state. So actually here rho 2 2 is 1 and here rho 2 2 is 0 and all the atoms are in the ground state. So you see, as a function of the phase shift that we acquire during this time of flight time, we're going to change the output of the atoms at the two ports being in the excited state or being in the ground state. And that's exactly the same that we encountered with the light field in the Marxinda interferometer, depending on the relative phase that you pick up in the kind of interferometer arms, you can have different intensities coming out of the intensities 1 and 2 at your final detectors at the output ports of your Marxinda interferometer. So this is what the signal would look like. This is the Ramsey interferometer output signal. These would be the atoms in the excited state as a function of the detuning. We saw that if we have no detuning, we come out here with all the atoms in the excited state. Right? It's just like 2 pi over 2 pulses. So that's just pi over 2 pulse plus pi over 2 pulse giving us a pi pulse, bringing us to the excited state. If we pick up a pi phase shift, on the other hand, we're going to come out here exactly at zero. And we have all the atoms now in the ground state. So this would be rho 2, 2, 0, all the atoms in the ground state, because the action of the second pi over 2 pulse now de-excites the atom to the ground state. Now, if you look at a case and you want to actually measure how is your oscillation frequency of the light field detuned from the oscillation frequency of your atom, what would be a good point to work here in this so-called Ramsey fringe signal? So this is what we call a Ramsey fringe at the output of our interferometer. Where would you place yourself in the detuning to measure kind of how much you detune to measure deviations now of your light field relative to your atomic transition frequency? Well, the best point, the most sensitive point, would be exactly on this slope here. Okay? If you're on this slope and your detuning increases slightly, you're going to see a little bit more atoms coming out in the excited state that you detect. And now your detector tells you you're getting more than 50% of the atoms out in the excited state, so you have to reduce the frequency of your light field. So if you have if you're sitting up here, you're having too high frequency, you have to change the frequency back down again to bring the atoms back down to this 50% point. If on the other hand, you're down here in the slope, you're having too low frequency of your light field relative to the atomic transition frequency, and you have to increase the frequency of light to drive the atoms back to the 50-50 state. So actually, if you want to measure how the light is detuned relative to your atomic transition frequency, being on such a slope here is the best thing to be. At the top here in the maxima, you are, first of all, you're not very sensitive and you won't be able to tell in which direction to change your detuning if your output of atoms in state 2 changes. So if the output lowers, you could be here or here and you don't know what to do now with your detuning. Should you increase the detuning or decrease the detuning to bring your uh, light field back into sync 
uh, with the atomic oscillation frequency. So if you're trying to build an atomic clock and you're trying to stabilize the frequency of light to the frequency of an atomic transition frequency, you're typically sitting on such a fringe which tells you how much you need to change the oscillation frequency of your light field to bring it back into synchronization with the oscillation frequency of your atom which acts as the clock in the system. So this is what I wanted to tell you today about the Ramsey interferometer. I hope you understood the beautiful analogy of this Ramsey interferometer with the Marcinda interferometer. And we're actually going to use it a lot in quantum optics. This is the tool to measure phase shifts between atomic superposition states. Whenever we want to measure phase shifts, you use an interferometer. And when you want to do that for a two-level atom or any atom, you use Ramsey's method of a Ramsey interferometer. Thanks a lot for watching and see you next time.